History happened everywhere. The verdict. This is our after show podcast where we look back at the most recent episode, episode 81, Faith in the Kamchatka Peninsula between 1450 and 1750. So if you haven't listened to that, go back and check it out or else you'll find spoilers ahead. Do you know I've just spilt my wine over everything? Oh. Hello, my name is Pete Goddard and I'm here in the HHE studio with the prostrate worshipper to my giant mechanical raven, it's Mr. Ryan Weir. Prostate worshipper? No, very different. Prostrate, kneeling down on on the floor, you know. Oh, yeah, no, that makes a lot more sense. And of course we're joined as ever by the definitely doubtful of deities, the judge himself, it's Mr. Paul Dursley. Well, I knew what prostate means. I don't doubt it. (laughs) Could you put your finger on it? (laughs) Now, moving on from the prostate talk, uh, Ryan, I've been fighting with bears all week and consequently the trauma has made me forget everything about the last episode. So I wonder if you could remind us what happened in about 60 seconds. When would you like me to do it? Now. In this week's faith-filled episode, I transported us to the remotest corner of the planet to explore the fascinating faiths that shaped the Kamchatka Peninsula. We began with the spiritual beliefs of notable indigenous tribes, learning that volcanic hot tubs are the pathway to the afterlife, and that a giant mechanical raven can help bring good fortune. We then met Ivan Bereznoy, a courageous Christian missionary who used extraordinary and unorthodox methods to convert the native peoples. And finally, we uncovered the radical Scotsy sect, whose disturbing belief in spiritual purity led them to applying red-hot pokers to Kamchatkan's genitals. It was a journey filled with volcanic peaks, salmon-rich rivers, and babushkas knitting with moss. It was a captivating clash of faith and wilderness that one of our listeners today described as pretty good. It was faith in the Kamchatka Peninsula during 1450 to 1750. Last week's episode done, summarised nicely, nice one son, now we're over to a young Dursley who's gonna tell you what he thought of me, he'll take you apart without any care, he's the lovely Paul Dursley, the lovely Paul Dursley. Ah, yes, it's all coming back to me. I feel like pretty good feels like a little understatement, but my opinion, as we know, is worth nothing. We're here for the opinion of one man and one man alone, Judge Dursley. So, Paul, do you have any initial feelings and feedback to give us? Satisfactory. Satisfactory when you're going up in the world. (laughs) (laughs) Now, you're often a well-travelled man, Mr Dursley, but uh, I wonder if Kamchatka is a stretch too far for you. Have you ever been to the area? Beach Japan, but sort of Tokyo and south, so that's still a long way from Kamchatka. It really is a long way away from almost everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of its main feature, isn't it? Remoteness. <laughs> but uh, is it something you knew about at all, Paula? Because Ryan and I were pretty much entirely ignorant of the place. Well, as a lover of geographical quirks and things like that, it always has fascinated me. And in terms of the overall information, was it all stuff you were basically familiar with? Because I thought there was quite some deep cuts there by Ryan. There was some interesting stuff. Yes, well, I, I, I have to be honest and uh, I knew very little about Kamchatka, apart from, I can remember, didn't Michael Palin go there on one of his journeys? The TV traveller. Yes, and ex-Monty Python. I, I could just remember some of the sort of volcanic lakes they flying over, and they were this sort of weird, sort of orangey, muddy colour. It's an extraordinary place. Every photo and video I've looked at, I could just sit and look at for hours. It's, it's incredible, from the fauna to the flora to the... For, for all Fossil, <laughs> minerals, <laughs> fish. But I have to say, Ryan, when I, I referred to deep cuts, because normally there's something in the episode that I find interesting and I'll do a little Google to find out a bit more and pull on the thread a little bit. Yeah. I, I, the first one I had to look at was Ivan Brezhnoy. The missionary? Yeah, the missionary. And I thought typically you type in Ivan Brezhnoy and the first thing that would come up is this guy because he's the famous Ivan Brezhnoy. What I got was a web developer in Ukraine. So <laughs> 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 uh, I thought about dropping him a line and asked, 
ask him what it was like. <laughs> uh, so no, I, I had very few. I only do a surface skim. But normally something comes back, but no, nothing at all. So you obviously were digging deep there for some of that stuff. Yeah, it's it's a remarkable thing when you're doing the research for these episodes. You know, where there's very little history going on, you get like one reference to somebody, and you're like, oh, okay, and then you find out, well, where would he have trained? So that's a different question. It takes you to a different resource, and you end up just eventually piecing these pieces together and you get an overall image of who this guy was and what, he, what his life might have been like. Yeah, I thought you did a great job and uh, I was very impressed. I also pulled a little thread on the Ittlemans because I couldn't get over the thought of the Ittlemans. Yes, are they next door to the Big Bigmans? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was waiting for that throughout the whole episode. <laughs> a weirdly cosy feel to them, but uh, I found out <laughs> a few extra Ittleman facts for you, Ryan, if you're interested. Oh, I'd love to hear some more Ittleman facts. You may have heard these, but... One site I found said that the shamans were mainly elderly women and rarely men. I did not find that. Ah, okay. And, and I like this one, in contrast to the practice of the shamans of the Koryaks, who I guess are a neighbouring tribe or people. They were. We spoke about the Koryak. Yeah, the, the Itzelman shamans did not use a tambourine. Oh, right. For which we can only be grateful, I think. <laughs> uh, I didn't realise the Salvation Army got that far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shaking the tambourines. No, they did not use tambourines. But uh, also, according to the Itzelman mythology... The world beyond the grave after death is organised exactly the same way as our world. So it's the same as our world, except that it is better in every respect, which you would hope for. <laughs> but That what? just sounds like going on holiday, though. It's, it's the same as my normal life, but it's just better in every respect because it's on holiday. The holiday of the afterlife, exactly. Yeah. So, so it does beg the question, why don't they all kill themselves then? Well, I, I, I assume you have to just kind of earn it by going through life as best you can I suppose it doesn't specify how one gets to this afterlife that's so awesome but what really struck me was they found that the Ittleman carried seriously ill and dying people out of the house to the tundra or mountains and left them there exposure okay often those people went away themselves if someone died in a house the house had to be abandoned and basically it says the deceased were neither buried nor cremated so dumped I guess is what's left well I mean these were semi-nomadic people anyway so what does that actually mean if you're a nomadic person i guess the end of this season's house i suppose isn't it yeah i guess so female shamans though female shamans sans tambourine (laughs) (laughs) so disturbing it just comes out of nowhere look it's a 50 quid bottle of wine so it's not like a strong stream it's just this pissy weak we're back to the prostate here (laughs) So, Ryan, is there anything you couldn't bring to the table that you ran out of time or wasn't appropriate but you found? As well you know, Pete, there was. (laughs) There was a whole section that ended up on the edit room floor. I was there. I saw it. There was a whole section. So it was chopped off. As if it, as if you were a Scopsy. <laughs> was yes. it a little chop or a big chop? It was a lesser seal for purity's <laughs> sake. So this is a period in the late. 1500s and a number of sort of merchants and explorers from Russia have started to probe the lands of the East Ural Mountains in search of furs and minerals and they're looking specifically for a way to the Pacific Ocean where they can then trade with the Chinese. And so that brings us to the year 1651, half a century before Bereznoy reaches Kamchatka. So we're in the Kargopol region of Russia and a baby boy is born and his parents name him Vladimir Atlasov. Atlasov, he grows up, he studies, he leaves education and he, as a loyal servant of the crown, decides he's going to enter the Russian military. And over time, he proves himself this adept and capable leader. So much so, in fact, that in 1696, Tsar Peter the Great appoints Atlasov as the main man to lead the first expedition to the Kamchatka Peninsula. Well, he's got the name for it, hasn't he? Atlasov. Can you fill in the rest of this atlas? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were talking about Peter the Great. <laughs> (laughs) (laughs) No, he was another fine fellow, let's face it. Um, Where's the Ryan the Grey? Yes, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Now, Atlasov greedily accepts, and in the summer of 1697, he and an army of 100 men set out on their adventures east. And so... 
after making the arduous journey that we discussed with Ivan Bereznoy, he and his men find themselves on the southern tip of the Kamchatka Peninsula. And in the first few years, Atlasov becomes the first recorded person to travel the entire length of the peninsula and the first person to map the entire region, including islands off the southern tip. Uh, he claimed resources. He encouraged indigenous people to sort of pledge their allegiance to the Russian Empire. Encouraged. <laughs> yeah, encouraged. <laughs> How do you fancy signing this? Here's your flag. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, at one point, he and his men were captured by the Ittlemans. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and locked in the front room. Uh. Yeah, the Ittlemans held them captive for several months and uh, even threatened to kill them. But Atlasov, he negotiated his way out and uh, he went on to bring the entire peninsula under Russian control by 1699. That's just three years after he arrived, which is <laughs> remarkable. Um, so he commissioned the construction of Verkhnakamchatsk. It's the first permanent Russian settlement in Kamchatka. And it's the place where he had the tribesfolk come and pay their tributes. And their tributes were furs that Atlasov then used to establish a lucrative fur trading industry. And so there you go. With his mission completed, he returned back to Moscow in 1701, where he was promptly promoted and sent back to Kamchatka full time. Good news. <laughs> <laughs> and on his journey back to Kamchatka, Atlasov and his men loot a Chinese ship and it's seen as an act of piracy. So he and his men are tracked down, arrested, and they are imprisoned. So he sits in jail for four years before eventually he makes an escape and he just disappears until five years later in 1711 when he is found dead after having been killed by his own men. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently due to some conflict that they'd had over him being in charge. They just didn't think that he was a good leader anymore and that was the end of him. But despite that, today Atlasov is largely remembered, especially by the Russians, as a courageous explorer, the first person to open up the peninsula to Russian settlement, while other people have a more controversial view on him, which is that he was a ruthless conqueror and murderer. But whichever side you fall on, I think it's a remarkable achievement. And, you know, it really took a lot of strength of character, a lot of self-belief. Oh, that was your link right there. Uh, it sounds like his negotiation skills just ran out at the end of what you're saying. Couldn't get himself out of that one, could he? Just, he finally found the one thing he could not talk his way out of. So, Ryan, let's talk castration. Yours or mine? <laughs> well, neither of the above, hopefully. But uh, you did mention that there was a fad, could you call it? A certain belief that uh, castration or castration plus was on the menu. But I, I sort of had a vague memory of castration in choir singing. So I had a little look at castrati. Castrati. Exactly. So I looked up castrati and I found something that, that I hadn't really realised. So a castrato is a, a male singer who, before puberty, is castrated with mm. the idea that that's before their voice breaks so they can maintain these higher voices but what i had not realized was on top of that i i'd always imagined it would sort of stunt your growth if you had this procedure oh no exactly so gigantism is one of the side effects of not having all of this testosterone really yeah so what would happen was the bones didn't harden so they would keep growing and they grow to be unusually long uh, and what that meant was they were usually not small which i'd always imagine them to be but actually yeah. very tall and they had a very large rib cage which gave them this huge breath capacity. So one of the things that they were known for, not just the highness of the voice, but they could hold a note for this extremely long time because they had this massive rib cage because their ribs had grown out longer than uh, someone who hadn't had the procedure. I was just thinking, I was just wondering if that's why we have a lot of tall people now. Like, I wonder if that influenced society and then I, just, <laughs> then I put two and two together. <laughs> maybe, maybe those genes weren't passed down. <laughs> one of the uh, supremely unheritable traits. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I just thought I was an interesting uh, foray into the castration of people and the various reasons it's been happening around the world. I, the thing that I find remarkable is I can understand how one or two people have this kind of idea and it makes sense to them because it's, I don't know, I don't know why it might, but uh, it doesn't make sense to me. But to then convince large numbers of people that this is a good idea, something that's clearly not good for you, mm. it's an amazing thing to achieve. And I'm, is it just their persuasiveness? What was, what, what was it that makes someone 
do something to themselves that's so clearly peculiar. I think, you know, the thing that we're learning, I think, during our own culture is that fear is a powerful motivator. I guess there's all sorts of cults that actually end their own lives, which is an even more extreme form of it. I I guess you can deprogram someone from a cult, but there's no coming back from that, is there? I mean, not without some glue. (laughs) Can't just glue on a couple of dice from a Ford Escort. <laughs> I don't know why it caught me, but that idea of urinating out of a cow horn, <laughs> I don't know why that got picked up in the history books. <laughs> Everything about that was horrible. Thanks for bringing it to the table, Ryan. Which way round are you picturing the cow horn, by the way? I have it kind of jammed in narrow end to a little hole. Right. No, I, th- I thought it big end to the body. Uh, yeah, I, I was with you, Pete, until I just was. Ha- we were just having this conversation, and then I thought, <laughs> no, that makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It doesn't, does it? <laughs> Did they try to invent a female urinal? And basically, what it was was something called a she we. Yeah, and it was basically a horn like that. And I was pretty certain that they put the big end to the body. Yeah, the cup, yeah, yeah over that the body with a spout much going more out. Sense. Yeah. Now you've said it, Ryan, I feel like a fool. But. Well, no, me too. That's why I brought it up. Because, yeah, I'm like, actually, <laughs> why would you put the tiny end? <laughs> it's just like a plug in a socket sort yeah, of situation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just slots right in. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, we're laughing about something that was horrendous. Yeah, really 100,000 people did this, Pete. Did they or did they all just say they did it? Have you had yours done yet? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, I have. Well, I, I suppose there is a way to prove it, though, isn't there? Not without getting reported to HR. <laughs> <laughs> So, guys, you'll remember, during the history section, I spoke about the fact that Kamchatka was effectively turned into a military zone during the Cold War. You did. Mm -hmm. Silos were referenced. Yeah, uh, and I said that when the Cold War ended in 1991, the military closed up shop and Kamchatka went back to being this remote wilderness place, right? You did. I did. And that is true, but only partly true. Because looking into it a little bit more, I found that the Russian military still has a presence in Kamchatka. They never fully went away. And specifically, the Kura Missile Test Range, which is in the northern part of the country, it's considered one of the most secretive and heavily guarded military installations in the world. Do you get this from now, Wikipedia? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you Why? have to go deep? Have you got to, Well, if it's the most secretive thing in the world and you Googled it. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard this information on the dark web. <laughs> now, as its name suggests, Kura is considered an impact area for intercontinental ballistic missiles. Now, those are the ones that carry nuclear warheads and they can travel a range greater than 5,500 kilometres. That's 3,400 miles. Although it has also been used to test the SS-18 Satan, which is one of the most powerful missiles ever built with a range of over 10,000 kilometres. 7,000 miles. Imagine someone oh. 7,000 miles away shooting at you. <laughs> you sit there, you wouldn't have a clue, would you? Kura is controlled by the Russian Strategic Rocket Force, which is itself part of the Russian Space Force, and it is located around 155 miles from the capital city. Uh, but it is a big area. It covers 100 kilometres, that's 62 miles long, and 50 kilometres, that's 31 miles wide. Uh, it opened in 1957, 100 136 missiles were tested in its first five years, and since then, hundreds have been tested. Uh, But it did include a missile test in 1978, which went wrong for reasons unknown. And according to official reports, it resulted in the deaths of at least 10 people. In fact, Kura missile test site continues to be active today. After the Russian parliament cancelled the nuclear test ban treaty in October this year, 2023, an intercontinental ballistic missile was launched in Kamchatka just days later on the 25th of October, 2023. So how do they test a missile? Do they just fire it up and down or in a short range or do they make it go in a big circle to go 7,000 miles? This is like any testing, Peter. You know, it's you have a test plan and so you have to test different bits of it so sometimes they'll test the engines work 
Sometimes they sort of will test that it can insert into a ballistic trajectory and then sometimes they'll test the coming down bit and sometimes they'll test the range and accuracy. And of course you could arrange those, I guess, into classic test cycles and you could probably test three or four of them in one go. Sorry, Judge I'm Dursley being a is available for contract work. I was going to say, it feels like you're advertising yourself there. <laughs> I am a business analyst as well, yes. Uh, but anyway, while alarming, missiles aren't the biggest threat that comes from Kamchatka. So on the 4th of November 1952, a magnitude 9.0 earthquake occurred in Kamchatka, which resulted in a tsunami that caused extensive damage to the peninsula, but also much to the Pacific. So there was this one settlement in Kamchatka that was hit three times by waves which measured 60 feet high. <laughs> 60 feet high. 60 feet high, yeah. Now, fortunately, a lot of the town's inhabitants had sort of fled before the first wave hit. But when the wave hit and then receded, they went back into the town. And then the second and then the third wave hit. Oh, man. So was this on the side of the peninsula that faced the rest of Asia? That's correct, yes. So yeah. that it was basically kept on getting reflected off the other side. That's exactly right. Very good point. Yeah, and it resulted in the deaths of between ten to 15,000 people. That's 40% of the town's population. But like I said, the tsunami didn't just affect Kamchatka. The waves from it travelled throughout the Pacific, hitting as far away as Peru, Chile and New Zealand. There was reports of some logs breaking loose from a log boom in Oregon, four boats being overturned and sunk in California, and about $17 million worth of damage to the Hawaiian Islands, including the deaths of six cows. Oh, not the cows. Why? Bessie! I have to admit, I've, I've, I'm very fascinated by tsunami footage because, you know, you see the Hollywood movie where it's 60 feet it's tall. It's nothing. It's nothing. Yeah, you see this thing that's just rippling in and it looks like nothing at all and then it hits something very substantial, obliterates it or picks it up like it's nothing and then you think, oh, there's an awful lot more force going on there than I realised. Yeah, it's, it's when you see those real pictures, it makes me think that you, you know, these people who think things up for you know, disaster movies, they don't have a very good imagination, do they? Because it's actually worse than they ever think. And, you know, when you think about the debris that's floating around in that water plus the aeration so all the air in the water, the bubbles, which stops things from floating. So you're just dragging along the bottom. Mm. And then and then all the flammable liquids, because the Japan yeah. tsunami, the thing that fascinated me or shocked me, actually, was you know, vast areas of that water over the land were just on fire. And that's, of course, without the sewage overflowing. And well, no, I can't remember which tsunami it was. I read where a schoolgirl saved a bunch of people's lives because she noticed the thing that happens before a tsunami, which is the tide goes out a long way. And she knew what this meant and shouted to everyone, ah, get out. And everyone did. And uh, lo and behold, they were saved by this small child who had the presence of mind and the confidence to shout, everyone run. Yeah, good for her. Yeah, because it's, it's, yeah, you know, you know, it's paradoxical, isn't it? It's fascinating. Oh, this, what's happening to the See, it's going away. You almost would want to walk toward it, but no, you actually need to run away from it. What if you did walk towards it? You would have further to run when you see it coming back. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really understand that statement. I just figure it would be worse if it comes to towards you. Just like, you know, just charge it. <laughs> Well, at least as a public information service to our listeners, they now know if the sea goes out, you start running. All right, guys. Well, look, there's one last thing that I wanted to talk about, and that was the giant mechanical raven. Ah. A standout character, I felt. <laughs> well, look, yes. During this section about the indigenous people of Kamchatka, I spoke about the giant mechanical raven, which the Koryak considered to be the creator of the world and the sky. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit more about that, because while it is true that the raven is associated with creation, the character of the raven is is complex and it doesn't quite have that same level of deity status that you know gods of more mainstream contemporary religions have in fact the raven is a multifaceted beast in their stories about him they portray him as something of a bit of a trickster so as an example here's one of their stories 
Once, when the world was in darkness, and the sun and the moon were kept by a powerful and wealthy chief, the people were suffering without light, and the raven decided that he would steal the sun and the moon and bring light to the world. But he knew that he couldn't just take the sun and the moon from the chief, as he had loads of strong guards, so he came up with a cunning plan. He transformed himself into a leaf and he allowed himself to be swallowed by the daughter of the chief, which instantly made her pregnant. <laughs> As we all know, that's how pregnancy works. This raises a lot of questions for me, but carry on. <laughs> I, was, I was sort of semi with you as a myth until then. Now, in time, the chief's daughter gives birth to a boy, or so it seemed, because in reality, it was the raven in disguise. <laughs> so the raven turned himself into a leaf, but couldn't just turn himself into a boy. Yeah. Right, got it. Carry on. <laughs> now, as the grandson of the chief, the raven stroke boy, is loved and spoiled rotten, he cries and he fusses until eventually he is given the boxes containing the sun and the moon to play with. But as soon as he has his little human baby hands on them, he transforms back into a raven and he grabs the sun and he grabs the moon with his beak and he flies away. But as he's flying away, the chief and his guards, they try to stop him. But all they can manage to do is grab parts of the sun and the moon which break off in their hands during the struggle. And so the raven manages to escape with the sun and the moon and he succeeds in bringing the light to the world. And by the way, that damage that happened to the sun and the moon, that explains why the moon has phases and the sun has spots. Ah, I see. Well, that was a nice story, Ryan. Thank you so much for that. The lesson there is don't get pregnant by swallowing leaves. That's uh, something that I've tried to avoid my whole life. <laughs> And so we've come to the end of the line. It's time to step into the dock and prepare to face the people's judge. Judge Dursley, are you ready to give your verdict? I am. Then will the defendant please rise? I am risen. Your Honour, as usual, may we start proceedings by first asking your verdict on factual content. I think there is a satisfactory preponderance of facts. OK, and your grade for factual content then? So, for factual content, I will give you... B. B, solid, good. So, Mr. Dursley, entertainment value, did you enjoy yourself? Did you have a good time? Uh, I had a good time, but it was mainly to do with the subject and the time period, not necessarily with your witticisms this time. <laughs> That's fair. That's acceptable. Uh, I, I would probably challenge anyway if you get Kamchatka. A, if you don't know what it is, it's quite an interesting word. B, if you know what it is, it's an interesting place just from the shape on the map and where it is. So that in itself, it's, it's inherently interesting, has sort of some entertainment value. So given that, I think I will give B minus. I'll take it. Interesting. I'll take it. A B and a B minus. This is good. B heavy. You're in good territory here, Fry. And finally, the ever difficult to predict Dursley factor. Paul, how did it tickle your fancy? It did tickle my fancy. I, th I think I refer you to the answer I gave earlier, but but also I think you were pretty good at sticking to the breeze from finding some interesting stories. So I think, as, as your listener said, uh, pretty good. Um. Do you know what? Sit down, Ryan. I'll give you a minus. <gasps> oh Unprecedented. The crowd goes wild. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Well, that brings us to the final verdict. But before the judge passes his ruling, Ryan, you have an opportunity to enter a plea. Do you choose to do so? Oh, this is interesting. No, I don't want to make a plea. I just want to say that I really love doing this episode. Kamchatka terrified me at first. I had no idea what it was or where it was. <laughs> and it was a delight to uncover what an incredible place it is. It was just a real pleasure of an episode. To, to research and pull together for you so I hope you all enjoyed it excellent glad to hear it Ryan so your honour the defendant stands before you have you reached a verdict yes I have so I must ask respectfully for your ruling I think that for once you've done a pretty good job yes I think 
it's not quite a leading A, I'm sorry. I'll give you B plus. Damn it! Do you know, I think I might have ruined it by going, yes. <laughs> this is the closest you've ever got. <laughs> Ryan, anything to say about the excellent grade? B+. Plus. B+. Plus. B+, plus, that's all I'm going to say. B+. Plus. I'm going to be saying it all week. I'm going to get a badge <laughs> made, and I'm going to have a cake with a B plus candle. A B plus cake. Good for you. OK, well, that is our show for this week, then. If you'd like to get in touch about any of the things we've talked about on the show or you just want to say hello, you can reach out to us on social media through our website at hhepodcast.com or you can email us, Pete and Ryan, at hhepodcast.com. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. And you never know, you might end up featured on a future show. One way to definitely feature is to rate and review the show on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts. If you recommend us there, it brings the show to new listeners, and we love that. Now, if you are on Mastodon, Facebook, Instagram, X, we're there too. So you can find us at HHE Podcast. And if you subscribe to those, you're going to get an alert every time we post any trivia tidbits, news and photos. And if you'd like us to package up trivia tidbits, news and photos in an email and send it out to you, you can just send us an email to Pete and Ryan at HHEpodcast.com with the subject line newsletter. Oh, I forgot you had this pathetic attempt to try and get more people on board. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be back again soon with our next episode which is coal in wales in the 1920s yeah and in the meantime a huge thank you to the judge himself thank you paul my pleasure and i guess that's it all that's left to say is you've been listening to Ryan, we were talking about belief. We were. Well, faith, but yeah. Well, yeah, and I, my, my immediate go-to point was belief as a religious belief. And I knew that the judge is not a big believer in religion and whatnot. So I thought I'd try and look at the science of religion. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so I discovered there is a thing called neurotheology. Yeah. Also known as spiritual neuroscience, which is scientific attempts to explain religious experience. So neurotheology is a term apparently first used by Aldous Huxley, weirdly, in a novel called Island. But some of the things that have been found, someone called Andrew B. Newberg has found that intensely focused spiritual contemplation triggers an alteration in the activity of the brain that leads one to perceive transcendent religious experiences as solid, tangible reality. In other words, the sensation that Buddhists call oneness with the universe. Basically, he's saying if you block sensory inputs to the one of these regions of the brain, as you do during the intense concentration of meditation, you prevent the brain from forming the distinction between self and not self. Dumb this down for me. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of your brain where normally it's taking various inputs to go, this is me and this is things that are not me. And if you meditate deeply, you shut that bit off and you lose that sense of distinction between yourself and the rest but of the universe. This, this is the same as flotation chambers, isn't it? Where the tests that the US forces did by so, sort of covering people's eyes and blocking their ears uh, and making them float in salt water for days on end. Um, and what happened? They went bonkers, I would imagine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they did. They went mad. And But as they would do that, they were having hallucinations and seeing things and having out-of-body experiences. It's a small leap to an angel, isn't it? <laughs> I'm not against, you know, people saying some people, you know, do have those. But it's not religion. It's, it's effectively a type of drug. Religion as drug. <gasps> Should it be controlled? I like the idea of giving Paul some religion drugs. Maybe we can get him some from the Methodist Church. Hey! <laughs> That's pretty good, actually. Thanks. <laughs>just for you. Yeah, thanks for listening all the way to the end. Now, if you enjoyed the show, please let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to take a moment to hit that like and smash subscribe. Hit that like? Yeah. Smash subscribe? Yeah, that's what people say. Do they though? Yeah, only the cool kids. And you think you're the cool kids, do you? No, we're the cool kids. Oh yeah, I suppose we are. All right, smash that like button, people. Smash it real good. Oh yeah, nice.